I'm Ted Seides, and this is Manager Meetings. This show is an exploration of investment opportunities. Through conversations with money managers conducted by one of the manager's institutional clients, we'll share the stories and strategies that attracted their attention and capital. You can learn more and join our mailing list at capitalallocators.com. All opinions expressed by Ted, guest hosts, and podcast guests are solely their own opinions and do not reflect the opinion of capital allocators or their respective firms. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon as a basis for investment decisions. Clients of capital allocators, the firms of guest hosts, or podcast guests may maintain positions in securities or managers discussed on this podcast. On today's manager meeting, Jim Dunn speaks with Julia Bonafetti. Jim is a past guest on the show and the CEO and CIO of Verger Capital, an OCIO whose anchor client is Wake Forest University. Jim previously served as CIO of Wake Forest and before that was CIO of investment consultant Wilshire Associates, where he worked with Julia. Julia was at Wilshire for 24 years, capped by serving as president of Wilshire Consulting and as a member of Wilshire's board of directors and Wilshire Consulting's investment committee. In 2016, she co-founded Rosetta Analytics, an investment manager reinventing active management by creating advanced artificial intelligence strategies. Their conversation includes a discussion of the past, present, and future of investment consulting, the application of neural networks and reinforced learning to investing, and the challenges for allocators in adopting an AI approach. Before we dive in, Jim and I discuss why he chose to invest in Rosetta and how the strategy fits into Verger's portfolios. Jim, great to see you. Ted, you as well. Thanks for the time. Yeah. So, This is sort of an interesting one, right? So neural network strategy, why don't we just start with how do you think about how that fits into your portfolio? Well, you know, it's interesting. Modern portfolio theory is not very modern, right? So we sit around and think about what's the next thing that we should be focused on and and learning about it and trying to do some more work on it. And and I think it's the ideation around this concept came from thinking about what was going on in the world, thinking about computer power, and thinking about what we're seeing our venture capital managers investing in these great companies that were going parabolic, looking at things like SaaS networks and all of these incredible technologies. But what we kept seeing, the common theme of all of those was the idea of computing power has just made these things possible. But what was not changing was asset allocation. And we started looking around and trying to find other investors that were looking at this. And Everyone was talking about machine learning, but in the concept of Go or chess, but not in a way that was able to invest in a real fashion. So as we looked at other managers in the space that were looking at this, it was sort of the big hedge funds, but they weren't able to share what they were doing because it was such an edge they felt. So we weren't getting a lot of feedback. So we sort of thought about this in a more general fashion. And then Julian Angelo came around and they want to do something different. And I think when we look at our portfolios and all of our managers we talked to, it's a sea of sameness. And it was sort of intellectually interesting for us to think about this as like a skunk works. Like, let's think about, can we use something out of machine learning? Let's start with the S&P, but then can we apply it to carbon? Can we apply it to portfolio construction, asset allocation? So the idea originally was for us was to use Rosetta as a skunk works to, be, to look at what else can we do in a better, more efficient manner now that we have all this computing power. So that coupled with the fact that we kept seeing the same managers, the same strategies, and felt that there wasn't a lot of edge there. So this was something that was totally different, and we felt that would be attractive to our portfolio. So when you take a new paradigm like that and still layer it into somewhat of a traditional portfolio without it, how did you think about how to size your capital allocation to that strategy within the context of your portfolio? There's two bets here, right? First one is on the manager itself. And I've known Julia for 20 years and worked together. And the fact that we still work together is is a testament to how her integrity and her ability to really be what she is, which is one of the best minds in investing that I've ever run across. And then the second piece is then we're going to save some capital to seed products. So we started with sort of a $5 million investment and, and it grew from there. So we now have four strategies with Rosetta. 
And three of them have been very, very successful. One of them has been turned off. Well, great, Jim. Thanks for that intro. And let's have at it. Hi, everyone. My name is Jim Dunn, and I'm so grateful to be here on Capital Allocators with my friend and former Wilshire Associates colleague, Julia Bonafetti. So, Julia, before we talk about AI and machine learning and the current wild investment landscape, tell me a bit about how this road to cutting-edge investment technology and investment started for you. You are not cut from the traditional Wall Street cloth. You're correct, Jim. I did not start out on Wall Street. I went a circuitous route. I grew up on a cattle ranch and spent uh, a lot of my time out with the horses and cows. I, I was on the rodeo team in high school and in college. And after graduating from Boulder, I went to USC and earned my master's degree in finance and entrepreneurship. And was really introduced to investing through one of my professors, Gil Babcock at USC, who taught really a, a very quantitative course on investing and was a member of the USC Student Investment Program, where we actually at that time, it was unique. Provident Investment Council had donated assets for the students to manage. And so we managed two portfolios, the Student Fund and the California Fund, and we were stock pickers. And so after leaving grad school and everyone else was getting jobs in marketing and some on as an, and investment banks, I ended up in the final interview process interviewing with uh, City National and with Wilshire. And after meeting the crew at Wilshire and how interesting the business was at that point, wasn't sure that I wanted to actually manage a portfolio, but having a more broader look at the industry from both the investment manager and the uh, allocator side, I ended up selecting Wilshire. So you and I both spent some time at Wilshire. Um, now I understand where those rodeo skills came to play <laughs> in your early career. But Wilshire was a lot different when you started than it is today. I'm very proud of my Wilshire days. And Wilshire's a great place to be from. I learned a lot there. Talk about how Wilshire's changed and how your career started. Well, so I started in the investment consulting group working under Steve Nesbitt at the time. And it was just one of those places and times where everything was new. Wilshire was on the forefront of building really the software applications that are being used very widely in portfolio management today. So it started by having the first pension information system, which allowed really large allocators to understand performance measurement. It was doing work with style analysis. It was competing head to head with Bara, building the first risk models. And from the consulting side, at that point, you know, when we used to create the big performance books, which were produced off of big mainframes and the asset allocation models, or Wilshire was a pioneer in one of the first asset liability models. All of that information that came together for that really started the consulting business had to be done in a very laborious way. Cutting and pasting was actually cutting and pasting. And so it was the ability to provide services and the need for information was great. And from helping to support the consultants there were new avenues to learn new markets at Wilshire. And one of the most exciting ones was the international division. Wilshire was primarily doing business within the U.S. at that point and had started doing business with Japan and really had not offered its services anywhere outside of the U.S. And the first thing that we did, we had a woman come in, Nancy Lang, who worked at institutional investor in the conference business and brought that to Wilshire. And we started taking our clients to emerging market countries. The first one was in Argentina. Then we went to Brazil and China. Uh, we went everywhere. I went to Vietnam before it was even open to the U.S., if you can believe that back then we really didn't go to Vietnam. And our clients and their investment managers, we met the highest levels of government. We worked with stock exchanges and really shared information. And it was really a, an interesting time because really the emerging markets didn't open up to U.S. investors until 1992. And so being able to be on the forefront of that and run that business essentially for a few years 
really gave me a huge view as to how non-USers and U.S. investors looked at investing and how U.S. investors in their investment managers, really what those risks were on the ground, not just the portfolio risks. So very interesting times. And at that point, after spending several years traveling all over the world, essentially by myself, and in many cases to open up these markets, Dennis Tito asked me to open our first non-US office in London for our analytics group. What was it like to be on the cutting edge of investment technology then? And these emerging markets and being one of the few women in this business at the time, what was it like to be a leader in that space? It was a very interesting time because I don't know what they thought I would just, they had a, with the equivalent of their money management directory. And I went down to the bookstore and I bought it and I just started calling investment managers. They'd heard of Wilshire because of CalPERS. And so I could get them to meet with us. But the whole concept of taking your portfolio at the security level, and and I spent a lot of time in the bond market at that time because one of our strongest products was the Wilshire Axiom, which really could decompose the risk and return of a bond portfolio. And back then, from a non-US perspective, it was really just sovereign debt and currency. And so that was available. The corporate debt market really wasn't evolved as much as it was in the US. And so I spent a lot of time with the leaders of German banks, their portfolio divisions, their treasury divisions, UK investors. I even had an East German client. And that was really interesting to walk from one side of Berlin to East Berlin and see the complete difference in what communism looked like versus capitalism. So I truly was exposed to some very unique issues. And as far as being a woman, you know, it was, (laughs) there were women at that time, they were just weren't in really in leadership positions. And I can remember maybe the one of the most awkward moments is I was, I think I was nine months pregnant with my daughter and I had to go meet with and train somebody at Citibank on how to look at one of our analytic reports. And I was so large, I couldn't get through the trading desk. And I think they were so appalled because everyone would just go on garden leave if you were pregnant, you know, you just didn't do that. And I was too busy. So, you know, I like Humpty Dumpty bumped my way through the trading desk. And then I had my daughter the next day and they sent me flowers. I thought it was really nice. What lessons did you learn being an entrepreneur that you brought back to Santa Monica when you went back to Wilshire? One of the great things about Wilshire is that if you had a good idea and you could figure out how to pay for it, that was the key. You could pretty much start anything. And so I really never had to go through a bureaucracy to try new things. And so if we wanted to launch a product, you know, sometimes it was by very rarely a group, but in analytics, trying new ways to, from a client service perspective, to build relationships, that was so important rather than calling a help desk and saying, how do I calculate duration? It was really, how can we be a consultant in analytics? And that was a really important part of getting our talented staff to understand how to serve clients rather than just answer questions. And so we did a lot of work in that, a lot of work in education, trying, it was one of the first, you didn't have a lot of documentation at that point. Everything had to be created from scratch. And so I did a lot of work trying to make it easy for clients to get what they needed because everybody was busy. And even when I took over consulting, at that point, it was very much all of the the service was done at the consultant level. There wasn't a lot of pooled material to help clients and to help scale the business. And that was understanding what it was that every client needed when they needed it. The markets changed so rapidly. You have even the consulting business. I mean, during that time period, it was a period of regulators. It was a period of just think that the advent of hedge funds coming through institutional investing and how you how you would separate the marketing from the actual meat and trying to help clients truly understand when you put a portfolio together that 
there is hidden beta in everything because everything is either the pure stream, you're either lending or you're owning, right? And then you put a lot of complication around those two concepts in whatever you're structuring and you can end up with a portfolio that looks like you're investing in asset classes or in in beta, whatever form you're beta, but it will be complicated depending on how complex you invest. And being able to distill information and a consultant's gift is truly to be able to break a very complex idea down into sound bites that the client can take back and really understand, okay, what are they telling me? What is this information showing me? How can I use it? How can I have a more efficient portfolio that's going to work well over many market environments, not just the current, because it's very difficult. One of the consultants used to say to me, Julia, pension funds work like icebergs. Okay. So you might start the concept and then many years later you might get to where you actually get movement and so understanding that you can't have instantaneous decisions and outcomes with clients especially clients that have boards and governance processes that have to go through a certain cycle of decision making and support it's it's sort of an ongoing push so going back to that last chapter before rosetta Talk about the consulting business today and talk about your experience helping these large pensions and sovereign wealth funds. And you were supporting millions of workers and millions of people's pensions. What was that like? And, and what was it like working with pensions all over the world? Well, clearly it's a huge responsibility and remembering every day that what a fiduciary decision is that you are, every decision that you make is has to be in the best interests of the beneficiary, which is the worker or the recipient of the fund. And it's very easy in this business to want to chase after the next bright, shiny thing, because it's very difficult to get through market cycles when you really need to be a long-term investor to make all of the investment theory work on your behalf. But what ends up happening because of either circumstances or short-sighted decision-making, really long-term investors have very short time horizons. And so you end up building portfolios that are more short-term than longer-term because you can't withstand the periods that you have to go through when you take risk where you're going to underperform either the market benchmark and in active management, it's very likely that you're going to underperform on average anyway. So based on a lot of the measurements and studies that are done on active management, it really depends again on what your information edge is. Jack Bogle had a view of really you should index everything and over the long term you'll get there at much lower fees and everything will compound. But the reality is is that most institutions can't invest that way for just by their very structure or by what they're trying to fund. And so the consultant's job is really to find the best solution that can work on average for that particular fund and putting a there are some general observations that work across portfolios, but really you're investing for your particular circumstances. And probably the biggest disservice that consultants have ever done is putting everybody in peer groups so that they compete against each other, even though that their liabilities are completely different and their circumstances are, are very different. It's just everybody likes to measure something and it's a new way to compete. Let's talk about that. Now that you're a reform consultant, talk about the consulting business. Where is it headed? Well, you know, it really changed dramatically after the great financial crisis. That really shook everybody to the core. I mean, there you can look at past and evaluate, okay, this is how everybody should have behaved through it. But any veteran who did go through it knows that during those months when really it was all hands on deck and everybody was trying to figure out where the were we going to be able to get assets flowing and dollars flowing through the system again was there a way to avoid it and really sure there was but it would have taken a lot of people calling certain 
behaviors out to have that happen. And for those investors that had portfolios that were structured a certain way, the big lesson learned was you really do have to understand liquidity and how long you can withstand not having it because benefits have to be paid, buildings have to be funded, people have actual obligations that they need to use those dollars for. And when liquidity dried up, it really caused some permanent loss of capital across portfolios. And so the reaction to that was, okay, we have to do this better. We can't afford these large losses and now we have to fund them. And so we spent the next decade really trying to understand how to structure portfolios, but essentially we just made everything more complex. And so from a, the consulting business's standpoint, the first thing that comes is all of your clients say, we need you to cut your fees, first thing. Okay, and then of course you do, because all your other competitors will say, okay, I will. And so you cut your fees and it's not a very scalable business anyway. It just does not have the margins of asset management. And so you found consultants just having to do more and more and more to be able to help clients build the protections and that they were trying to build so that they could be long-term investors rather than short-term investors. It's always the same story. So consulting today, that's why you've seen... <laughs> That's why you've seen a lot of consultants go into the OCIO business because they need to find a business that has asset management margins because you really can't scale the business. How much can you scale a person? And so there's many creative ways to do that, but really it's how can you get the economics of the business back to where you can actually afford the services you're giving. And consultants are the loved and hated of the industry, right? They are generally give good, strong, well-researched advice and can ask and act as a mediator between the investment management industry and the dollars, the assets. But at the end of the day, because they look for some uniform solutions to help build scale, it's easy for them to be the hated of the industry because they're close to the top of the food chain. Well, let's sort of talk about that a little bit. So you've been through modern portfolio theory, and then you lived through greed is good and junk bonds and den of thieves. And then you went through the great financial crisis and you had uh, too big to fail. And now you've got MMT and you've got ZERP and the new green deal. What does asset management look like in the next generation? What's coming? Well, really, it's, and this has been coming for a while, and everybody has seen. I mean, if you think about at Wilshire, we, at one point, we were always efficient market theorists. So if everybody has access to the same information, who has the information edge? And for many, many years, we didn't see value to active management really in U.S. equity. So more and more, if you looked at the core portfolio, that started to be more passive and more passive. And so, but that trend across the board has really accelerated, I believe, over the last, and you can see it where, depending on your market, everybody knows that the fees are in illiquid assets. So any asset management firm that doesn't have enormous scale has had to determine how they're going to diversify to keep their fees in a place where they can actually survive the economics of the business. You know, Wilshire was a big proponent of performance fees that has been popular in pockets throughout, but it's very much a feature of illiquid assets. And so it, there's two problems, right? If your two biggest liquid asset classes are equities and fixed income, and now you've gone through a yield curve that is still at incredibly low levels. So how do fixed income managers actually charge active fees on top of duration risk and low yields where investors are going to be looking at most of their portfolios and you're earning close to zero and on a real basis, you're earning negative. So that whole business model is in trouble in my view right now. Equities are priced to perfection. Fixed income is priced to perfection. So where do you rebalance 
and everybody is sending assets into private asset classes. So private equity has gained, hedge fund flows are gaining private real estate. It's finding high quality properties. You're just adding more leverage into the system to try to meet return objectives. And you look at everybody's asset class assumptions and everybody's backed into a corner right now. So in my view, portfolio, the asset management industry is really has to go through a big correction before any of this will shake out. But you've seen unprecedented mergers and acquisitions. You see boutique managers who have founders that are trying to transition. But how do you actually realize the value of what you've created unless you've been able to either merge or you've been able, there's one manager who sort of figured it out. She made a foundation and all of the employees know that that foundation won't sell the funds so they can participate as a transition from her generation into her firm, which gives longevity to the firm. But that's unique and from what I've seen in terms of how you how you evolve in this business outside of changing your investment lineup to higher fee strategies. I'm not sure if Ted has trigger warnings on this, but we have to warn people who are allocators or managers in fixed income. This is not a great story right so far. But how do we, people like us who are allocators that have to provide excess returns, how do we find better performance and better alignment? What's the path forward? I'll put two hats in here because obviously I'm co-founded Rosetta Analytics. And one of the main train principles of Rosetta that attracted me to want to spend time on this is really coming from the analytics side where I've seen and personally used factor-based quantitative investing for my entire career. It used to be that you would look at, first it was bottom-up strategies where you were picking stocks and you had armies of analysts that were researching and providing best ideas. And then that portfolio would evolve into how much to allocate to those best ideas you had concentrated And then the whole concept of managing to a tracking error as sponsors wanted to really manage the risk in their portfolios. And so all of that enhanced indexing, it was called that, and then it became smart beta, and now it's factor-based. All of that was really what was being measured by Wilshire and others from the 90s forward to try to determine those relationships. And At first, it was unique because not everybody was looking at their portfolios and through that kind of lens, but now everybody is looking at through that portfolio and that kind of lens. And the 2007 quant quake in August was a big wake-up call to everybody in terms of what happens when those factors are leveraged and how portfolio construction can all come together to to really impact the market. It could happen again. Think of the rise in dollars that are behind these assets. And I've seen some of the literature call it a factor zoo. But how, if those factors are really, you boil them down to six or five or three or however many you want to measure that have really persistent relationships, where is the information edge except for in how you time them. So if we're using these really linear factors that don't change, that only change because you're building them off of new time periods, then that really becomes an index. So Rosetta, we wanted to look at, was there a better way? And with the advent of compute power, I mean, Wilshire, we started with big rooms of mainframes and then we went to personal computers and it still took days and days and days to to build a variance covariance matrix. So now that as of 2014, you can go into the cloud and you can rent essentially as much time and as much power as you want and build your platforms. This has really changed the way that you can process data. And of course, with that, then investors started to look, not investors outside of the investment industry, looking at neural networks to try to see patterns in data. And so now you see it in 
industries is prolific, obviously, in search engines, in diagnostics, in self-driving car, in image recognition, speech recognition. We use it in our daily lives, but really we don't use it. It's starting in the fringe in asset management. And so if you think about a factor model where you have, from an academic standpoint, said these five factors are what are going to be the basis for describing risk and return of a particular security or asset, then that's the only framework you can use. And when it doesn't work, it's either out of favor or you have to go back to the drawing board and re-specify what that relationship is. Well, neural networks are designed to do that automatically, but they just don't tell you these are factors. They look for the hidden function. They search for millions of parameters, and it's a dynamic change through its process of backpropagation to determine what's the best relationship to describe what you're trying to describe. So be it return or whether you're trying to, to identify an image or whether you're looking for cancer, the power is truly remarkable. And so bringing that into asset management was really exciting because the traditional way of measuring relationships really leaves a lot of information on the table. You're either describing a small portion of that return or you're just building portfolios that don't have, aren't dynamic in terms of how those relationships changed. And we went straight from research on deep neural networks using deep reinforcement learning. And that to me is the game changer. That's what's going to deliver autonomous driving. That is what will and is changing. That's why they're using robotics to do dangerous jobs in manufacturing now because the dynamic decision-making and the way that you identify relationships and then act on those relationships, that's the power of deep reinforcement learning and in portfolio management to be able to look at a data set and then to be able to optimize that decision-making to maximize that reward is completely different than what's being done in portfolio management and in asset management today. And we've only been able to research because we're a small firm in public markets, but the ability to predict and to allocate, it's truly there. And we see it in our strategies performance. So Julie, you mentioned talking about neural networks. Give me some thoughts on what a neural network is and how do you use it? So if you think of a traditional model as one that is describing a relationship or think about common factor risk, that is a series of betas that explain a relationship or the sensitivity to data inputs in those variables, and then together they describe return, a neural network is actually able to look at millions of parameters, but it is looking at data and it is actually creating those relationships. So rather than starting with a, a framework where you say something like momentum or growth or value or size is determining what is generating the return, the relationships behind the return, a neural network is a framework that through a series of layers, and everyone's seen the pictures of the nodes and the connectors to those nodes, and, the, and it goes back and forth in a framework called backpropagation, where it is looking to, in a nonlinear way, to take all of the data that it's describing and determine relationships or features to try to minimize any error term or that it can't any explanatory power for what it's trying to predict. So in our case, we use neural networks to make a directional prediction, but we have actually taken the neural network and we're using a concept called deep reinforcement learning, which is, you can think of it as a decision framework, but an optimization that can look at multiple decisions or maximize multiple points at the same time to come to the optimal decision. But in a deep reinforcement learning process, you're using that neural network 
And it has the ability to learn new relationships where all other optimization functions will only use the parameters or the factors or the framework that the model itself is capable of producing. So you already have a boundary around what the optimizer is allowed to look at to actually structure the portfolio and the neural network adapts through time. So it's always sequentially building on its last decision or portfolio allocation and adapting through that. So it can maximize many objective functions at the same time to make a decision. So think about chess, you're always looking 10, 12 moves ahead it can survey the surrounding environment and make those decisions on an optimal front similar to the human brain and come up with the best solution, except for it has more power to absorb data than the human brain. So those decisions are multifaceted. It's very powerful technology. It's very exciting. How do you take that science that's effectively looking at everything we're doing differently and create a strategy? Well, the potential is vast. You can solve many different problems. What we chose to do is (laughs) the most difficult of all. We wanted to trade U.S. equities. It's the most liquid, deepest market in the world. And it's the market that's the most efficient, if you think about it from an efficient market hypothesis in terms of the level of information that investors have. But it also has a vast amount of data behind it. So we built our models to see if we could more effectively provide exposure more efficiently, and and when I mean efficient, be able to produce a return that could diversify U.S. equity and other asset classes and do it at a much lower risk than equity. So if you think about where you could place this in a portfolio, there are many allocators who have an absolute return component of their portfolio. You're typically trying to diversify risk with that allocation, but you end up sacrificing return in the process. So the deep reinforcement learning model can trade U.S. equity. It is capturing that elusive timing component that when you look at what can be explained through beta and what is typically put is alpha. It's when do you capture the relationship that you've identified if you have a fulsome relationship. Now, we all know that factors are spurious, but that's because they appear and they disappear at certain times and you don't know exactly when to make that bet. You just identify this historical relationship and then try to predict it. The deep reinforcement learning model is doing this all at the same time, and it detects the underlying behavior of what's happening with the pricing movement based on all the underlying inputs that you submit to the model, and it's determining that volatility measure, although you can't look back and say it's because of volatility, but the way it trades, it will typically, as it's sequentially adding value, trying to win at each change in allocation of the portfolio, and in this case, U.S. equities, it's building on that successful decision. It's taking a risk posture, so to hedge when it's seeing market volatility on the downside. And when it has the model has a true view of where it thinks risk is, it will short. But what you end up seeing in terms of the overall behavior of the portfolio is this very methodical capture of return at sometimes a third of the risk of the S&P, which gives you a very efficient return. Now, there are times also where you'll have long-only exposure to the market, which you're going to get the volatility in the market when you have long exposure. But it's those time periods when it successfully makes its decisions, and those decisions can be longer term, even though it's taking a view every day of where the portfolio should be. And so you can see how it builds on that decision. And we've been exceedingly pleased at the performance because while you can't point to value growth momentum, you can certainly see a compilation of behavior when you take the lens back and analyze the portfolio historically. And it's intuitive when you see the results. So I was reading something over the weekend. I thought about you. It was by Morgan Housel. He was talking about 1955 car accidents. 37,000 Americans died in car accidents in 1955. 
That's six times today's rate adjusted for miles driven. And it was because seatbelts were a $27 upgrade, and 90% of people didn't want that upgrade. So yeah, obviously things changed and seatbelts became the norm and everyone now has a seatbelt. In most cars, you have to have the seatbelt on or you have to hear that ding every time you drive. So that seems like an obvious improvement. But one of the strongest forces in our asset management world is it hasn't changed much since my portfolio theory. So what's the pushback? Why are people not adopting machine learning, neural networks, AI in a much larger fashion? It's because we're afraid to be replaced by the dangerous robots? What's the pushback? Well, I think part of it is that I was sitting in a conference last week where a large asset management insurance firm has been investing in a pilot project trying advanced AI methods. But when he described what they were doing, it was really an add-on to their process, Like because the whole theme of it was humans will put biases into it and you need humans to to be able to better manage these portfolios. So it'll be humans with AI, which of course you do need humans to actually build the models and you need skilled humans. And a lot of the skill is outside of asset management because for the first time, think about how B schools have operated. First, it was asset management wasn't really a focus in the MBA programs. Then it became a focus. And then you had econometrics or quantitative finance was a focus. But all of the skills that are being taught are based on modern portfolio theory, which all of those, nearly all of those equations are in an APT framework or a linear regression framework. And even traditional optimization methods used for portfolio construction their single process, they use the same inputs to be able to maximize return for a given level of risk. Or if it's a trading algorithm, it's really all about building complexity or distribution around that return. But the relationships underlying that return expectations don't change because the underlying data or relationships that they're used to optimize are the same. So I think it will get there. We have to evangelize quite a bit more. But if you think about just how an established asset management firm, the level of, first, they're they're under a great regulatory scrutiny. So their processes are tend to be a little bit or a lot structured. And so getting a new idea through to a new investment strategy into a client's is all going to be driven by, well, what are the economics? So greenfield asset management projects that require a certain skill set that typically you really have to spend a lot of time to understand, that's difficult to get through. I mean, there's been some very notable examples where the attempt is being made, but the actual application hasn't made it through into the investment process. And how do you go tell clients that, well, we're completely changing our transparent process into a model where we can't interpret? And so I think it's going to have to stay in places like absolute return because really what these models are capable of, there's going to take a lot of research, but they're shorter term right now. Eventually, the research will change to longer term. But the amount of alpha that can be captured in this dynamic decision making and reward maximization that it learns, that's the really interesting part is these relationships change and the optimization function is changing because the underlying relationships are changing and it's all in one process. So I think it'll get there. And thanks to, to you, Jim, for being forward thinking and to understanding what these future themes are and how it's going to change the industry. You know, it'll take pioneers like you. I've learned one thing, two things with you, Julie. The first thing I learned with you when we started this journey a couple of years ago was that I had to forget everything I learned about modern portfolio theory. I'm still learning that lesson. But I think the other thing I learned was humility, right? I think that the emotions that go into it, managing assets are a big driver of your success, your mental well-being, your portfolios, your clients, how they feel about you. So when you think about the humility that goes into asset management and you go into thinking about the emotions and all the behavioral stuff that goes into it, what role does neural networks or machine learning have in that conversation with clients? 
Well, I'm constantly thinking about what kind of client is going to truly be able to see the power of a neural network or a deep reinforcement learning, to be more specific, to take that chance. Because I compare against other managers in in the absolute return space, and really it's come down to, can we just not lose money? And so being able to actually earn a return at a lower level of risk is the unicorn, but that's really what a deep reinforcement learning model does. So the type of client that is going to be able to understand that really they need to observe how the model learns and trades is important. You've watched it now for three years and it's a difficult from your seat to watch an investment manager struggle through a market cycle that really they should be outperforming. And always the, the biggest sin was we changed our process. And so in the case of these types of models, they are changing their processes, but you really can't say this is why they're making this decision. You have to spend all your time in the back end understanding that you have designed and created a very robust model with the best scientific principles and controls so that you can allow the model to make decisions without interfering from a human standpoint. And you can see where from your seat that would be difficult, but the fact that they perform and they perform with lower risk is really how you have to make the decision. And we try to be as transparent as we can to educate investors so that they can become more comfortable with it. Because really, if you think about how rudimentary the other processes are that literally trillions of assets are invested in, at this point in this seat, I'm not quite sure why everybody feels so comfortable with their current frameworks. Because again, you could index and pay a lot less. So given all that, Julia, and machine learning is a tool that's been used for a while by high frequency traders and quant firms like Rentec and so on. But what you're talking about is something different. When you think about the decisions being made, the data that goes into it, what's the difference between what you're doing and what those firms are doing or traditional quant firms are doing? Well, we decided to focus on the technology when we started. So could we build machine learning, but we're using the very frontier of it with deep reinforcement learning. Typically, it's interesting, the term machine learning has been adopted and it does actually apply to traditional processes. So you have to be careful when someone says machine learning, they could just be using a traditional statistical framework to identify a relationship. And so Firms that have been on the forefront using this, they've gotten comfortable with the data sets that they use, the relationships they identify. The one that you mentioned is always referred to as not allowing their clients to invest. So they only invest it for themselves and they have to clear it every day because they don't want to move the market with the size of the fund. So I admire that they've been doing that for so long, but I don't look at them really as a competitor, because if you see how they performed during March and April 2020, they faltered with all of the other quant managers and the products that they were selling to clients. So I think that's a good indication of what happened in March and April, that that ability, and had the Fed not stepped in, you probably would have seen the true aftermath of what can happen with concentrated investments in the same kind of relationships and the same kind of data. So the power of what we're doing from a technology standpoint is that you have dynamic pattern recognition and it's not always the same pattern, right? It will optimize what the optimal number of parameters, and it can be tens of millions, not just five or six, that will change as the model is looking through the history of the inputs that you give it. And then from the reinforcement learning piece of it, so it is truly looking at not the different inputs, it's looking at the probability of the combination of those inputs, maximizing the best set of those constantly with each new data that it receives. It's truly multi-period, not just most multi-period optimizations use the same framework to build that decision. And 
the optimization process itself with reinforcement learning is the state is changing, the reward is changing, the probability of those relationships is changing. It's performing a multiple set of optimizations in a dynamic way to give the best prediction and the best timing of that prediction, which is why we see the moderated decision making, because as it learns to maximize the reward, the model, I don't mean to give it human characteristics, but it will moderate risk because it can see that taking full advantage of the underlying patterns may not lead to the best reward. And there's no other optimization process in the world that can do that. I mean, think about autonomous driving, the speed of information that has to go from the bumper sensors and from the surrounding cameras. And to be able to understand, stop when you stop, turn left, turn right, don't run into a tree, don't run into a truck. Think about processing all of that in real time to make those decisions. We don't manage real-time strategies, but ingesting daily data into our processes gives a whole new outlook on what that new decision is going to be. And the model can take all of that into account. One thing that struck me was that the markets aren't moving linear anymore. It seems like they are going only up and to the right, but there's so many different variables involved in the market processes that we're dealing with from fixed income to real assets, to liquidity, to interest rates, all those things aren't linear. So for us, it seemed like a no-brainer to have artificial intelligence kind of think about, can we take our hands off the wheel a little bit and let the car, with all this computing technology on the portfolio, run a little more efficiently? And we're not going to turn the entire portfolio over, but I do think there's definitely a way to get there faster with some technology, given all the computing power that's come to bear, and you see it everywhere. So we're very excited about Rosetta and its future. Maybe we'll shift a little bit. You were well known for being pretty tough on managers during your career as a consultant, What's it like being one now and raising capital? It's for sure humbling. I hope I didn't make anybody feel too uncomfortable. I think it was because of all of my time spent in analytics in investor portfolios that I had maybe a little different view in terms of how clients were looking for strategies. You know, you sometimes the marketing engine can be very strong. And remember from a fiduciary standpoint, that role is the primary role. You're there for your client. And if you're not fighting on behalf of your client, you're not doing your job. And so I completely get it. When talking to allocators, they're doing the best for in their seat that they're trying to do. And I expect it. In fact, when we finally get to where we want to be, it's going to make it that much better because we've been able to not only promote a technology that's going to transform asset management and eventually help everybody, but at the same time, getting to see the other seat, understanding, you know, how difficult it is to make these decisions. So I've been blessed to be in multiple seats. And so I've enjoyed every minute of the industry. And so I know that managers are really trying to do their best and clients are trying to do their best and somehow we'll all get there. But at the end of the day, we've got to be there for the beneficiaries of all of these funds. So where do those consultants now put you? You mentioned the biggest of service consultants have done to asset managers is have buckets. So what bucket do you fall into, Julia? It's interesting because one of my former colleagues who has, they're working on a pretty revolutionary asset allocation model. They analyzed our strategies and they said, oh, you're an equity replacement. You're an equity diversifier. And I said, yeah, but our product's short. So I don't think we can be an equity replacement. And she says, well, okay, so absolute return then. And I think that's exactly where it is. Think about it from your chair. When you rebalance It's a terrible place to be in right now. What is the least worse rebalancing decision that I have right now? And from the really interesting attribute of our products is there's no entry point because the models are trading in the environment they're in using all of the past experiences, but you can still earn the return without worrying that you came in at the highest level of assets and that when there's a correction that you're going to lose whatever percentage your value and have to start over. It's this ability to compound better because first, there's no entry point. You can start gaining the experience of the model in your portfolio. So from a rebalancing standpoint, it's a great place to rebalance into because it's not correlated to bonds. It's got lower correlation to equities and it's got 
a little, in most cases, at half the risk. So now that you're out raising capital, what's the most difficult thing for you as you speak to investors? Are there risks that you have to explain? Is it more about the strategy? Is it just the investment world we're in right now, the climate? What's the most difficult thing for you? I think it's difficult to onboard a manager in general. So I think probably the biggest hurdle to overcome is when we're an emerging women-led manager. So there's a lot of assets that are looking for opportunities to be able to help firms like us grow. However, the cost to doing so is pretty large. And so if you think about these investment programs and the number of managers they have and what it takes to switch something out, it's better if what they have is doing the job for them because that all that research has gone into that already. So we were talking about what's the most interesting client for us. And it's those that really have the time and the bandwidth to get to know what this technology is and what we've built so that it can work for them because the return profile is unique and it does diversify a portfolio. So there are investors out there. I know there are, but we have to keep telling our story. So let's shift gears now. You've been around a lot of great leaders, whether it's asset management firms, whether it's allocators, whether it's women in this industry. Give me some of the traits that you find in this industry make good leaders in asset management. The best leaders are the ones that really take time to understand who is supporting their ability to be a great leader. There's so many people in an organization that are working together for the greater good. And if you're a great leader, you've most likely you've built an organization where everybody has buy-in, they're rowing in the same direction. And when inevitably the business goes through whatever cycles it goes through, everybody feels engaged and has the ownership to want to see it through because there isn't a single great leader out there that hasn't been formed by either an adverse circumstance or just an army of people and mentors that got them where they are today. So to me, it's really paying attention to everyone in an organization and not just the higher. And it's hard because when you're in a leadership role, you have so many commitments on your time, but slowing down. And then I think the other key trait is always being thankful. You have to be thankful. This is such a great business and the great leaders that I've seen truly understand that it could have been anyone else at any given time for any given circumstance. And I never, ever feel that a great leader has gotten there on their own. There's a circumstance and there's a lifting up and a praising that needs to happen in your circumstance that can go away in a second. Well, I'm very grateful and thankful that I have you in my career, Julia, to help me make some of these leadership decisions. But thank you. Maybe we'll talk a little about your personal life. So what's the most important daily habit that you have? Giving thanks, praying. I think that understanding that, again, I can't say it again, that life is precious and and every minute counts and being joyful in, in every circumstance is important. Not always easy. What teaching from your parents most stayed with you? Well, I had the great fortune to be born from two entrepreneurs who I always called it Babies raising babies because, you know, they were young. I was young and it was being along with them for their journey. And it was always pretty basic with my brother and I. Don't hold a grudge. Always leave something better than you found it. Never judge a book by its cover because there are always people as people, as individuals matter. And if you judge them, you could miss out on a huge opportunity. A fool and his money soon part. That was a big one growing up. So (laughs) work hard, work hard and love what you do and great things will follow. So that might sound like platitudes or aphorisms, but I heard a lot of that growing up. What life lesson have you learned that you wish you had learned earlier in life? It's interesting because learning the difference between joy and happiness There's a huge movement of always being happy, but you don't get to always be happy in every circumstance. It's can you find joy 
in every circumstance? And can you help others find joy? Because truly, you only find it by helping others. You never find it when it's about yourself. Well, Julia, thank you. I can't thank you enough for the time and the insights. I'm very proud of to be an investor in Rosetta Analytics and what you guys have done to cutting edge technologies and what you've been able to achieve are really going to change the world as we see it on the investment side. We've already seen it in medicine and driving and robotics, but now it's time to bring it back to the investment world. So, Julia, thank you for your time, your friendship, and your leadership in this space. So thank you. Well, thank you, Jim. And we obviously wouldn't be here except for you. So we thank you and we thank you, the entire Verger team. You have an extremely talented group of people working with you. So you are a great leader. I hope you enjoyed this conversation and maybe even piqued your interest to explore further. See you next time. Thank you.